So hi everybody, it's Professor Spark here, and I'm joined today by Professor Dimitris Papadopoulos. Dimitris, thank you so much for joining me for this interview. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's terrific to have this chance to talk to you. Um, I should explain to everybody that Professor Papadopoulos is a new professor at UCSC in the History of Consciousness Department. He comes uh, originally from Greece, uh, but before, since then he's um, studied uh, here at UCSC and then went on to a career in British academia uh, at the University of Nottingham, yeah. right? And has done a lot of interesting work there um, on the environment and uh, pol political ecologies of uh, both environmental damage and uh, recovery and reparation. Um, and photography has been part of that work. And so he's a great person to turn to for advice around photography. Like many of the people I've been talking with for this series, he's not a professional photographer, <laughs> um, but has a lot of great ideas about photography. So, um, Demetrius, um, my opening question, uh, as you know, I've been asking people, what's your basic advice for students considering taking photographs for a photography competition that's premised on the idea of health for all and either the ways we can get to health for all or some of the uh, ways in which people currently experience ill health that you know is an example of how health for all remains very much a distant horizon at the moment. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking um that uh, perhaps a, a good starting point is um, an attempt to question uh, the evidentiary nature of photography. Because in a certain way we are trained to believe that, that a photograph is evidence for something. Mm -hmm. um, and I would call this perhaps the representational fallacy. We, we, we think that when we make an image when we take a photo, we represent something out there. In a certain way we do, but uh, we do it uh, through a series of mediations. So what, what, what we are trained to believe is that um, there is always this, this last bit of truth in a photograph that yeah. is captured from the original reality through our camera, through the lens of our camera, to the sensor or the field, and then through different channels to the viewer. And this truth travels all this very long way through many different, let's say, barriers, obstacles, mediations, undistorted to the viewer. But, but this is not the case. So we, we see it as a kind of technology of objectivity, but it's full of mediations. Exactly. There, there is no, no such thing as objectivity. But having said that, this doesn't mean that there is no content. And the question of what already Barthes, for example, Roland Barthes, uh -huh. was thinking about what manifests as a content in the photograph and what is added later to the photograph, what comes later what brings the viewer, what brings the people or the photographer to the photograph. And I think this is, this is an important question. We, we, we are discussing this question now, but I think probably the answer is wrong if we are trying to say a small part of it or a larger part, depending on your answer, is the truth, is the content, and the rest is added on. I would say that you have always the content coming through your photography. So you have 100% of the content from the beginning to the end, but you have 100% of mediation from mm -hmm. the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. So if you want to think, like if we think with a metaphor, perhaps you could say, um, you know, if you have, for example, water that moves to a solid state and becomes ice, you need the environmental conditions in order for this to happen. Um, so you need cold weather, for example. Yeah, yeah. So you, the environmental conditions change the, uh, the, 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 the state of the water, 
but the water is there all the time. Uh -huh. So you have the material 100% there and the environmental conditions are equally 100% fully responsible for this change. To use another metaphor closer, diffraction, you have, for example, when light passes through an object, the beams of light, the, the waves of light, of light become distorted and diffracted. Mm -hmm. Like through a prism or something like that. For, yeah. Through a prism. But more closely to photography, we have diffraction in small apertures of a lens. For those of you who take photographs, not with a smartphone, but, but a camera, then you will have to select an aperture yeah. and in smaller apertures, for example, F, F16 or F22, because the aperture becomes too small, the light needs to pass off a smaller hole in order to reach the sensor. And now, as all this beautiful light that we really need in order to take a photograph, all these photons hit the lens, they pass through this small hole and by being cramped in this ho small hole, when they reach the sensor, they are slightly distorted or diffracted. This is the lens diffraction in photography, which we need to be aware. I use this as a metaphor, although I, it's not just a metaphor. No. I'll say something more afterwards why it is not just a metaphor, but as a metaphor to say that the light, when it's diffracted, all of it is diffracted. So we have light and all of it is diffracted. So we have what we capture is always there, but it's always also diffracted. Mm -hmm. So it's not a percentage of truth and a percentage of addition. And this is the representational fallacy because we need to think, how is the, does this process happen? And this is something that I, I like to call uh, an approach to photography as constructivist photography. Mm. So photography is, is a constructivist undertaking and is something that we do and as we do it um, we make photographs. Yeah. We, and, and a constructivist photography is an invitation to think and reflect on this making of photography and I have some that, thoughts that how we really can... really resonates. It resonates with, with other things that Jim Clifford said to me when I interviewed him about sort of breaking down the, the dualism between the, the candid photograph and the posed photograph. And he ended up arguing that he prefers the posed photograph where the everybody involved, the, the subject of, of the ph photograph, the photographer and the audience all understand to some extent that there's this set of mediations involved. And those are, are more, those are surfaced more effectively. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the supposedly candid photograph isn't really all that candid. It's staged in a different way. And yet the staging is kind of obscured and yeah. 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 Is, is, uh, yeah, I, I think a constructivist take on photography is about revealing in the process of making a photograph these mediations. Mm -hmm. And they happen on, on different levels. We, we have um, w w one way photography is constructed or a photograph is constructed is through the actual context. For example, if, if you make a photograph as a researcher for a project, there is a whole context that you take with you. If you make photo, a photograph as somebody who, uh, who photographs um, um, a certain process for a science lab, mm -hmm. there is a whole context that you take mm -hmm. with you. The light, the cameras you use, the, the, the spaces where you do it, how you do it, how you process the photographs, the channels that it circulates, who's, who receives it, who sees it, yeah, and so and on. The, then the audience kind of knows, like say like the example of the scientific photograph done in a lab of, of like some insect or 
or bacteria or whatever it might be, um, those photographs are then generally shown to specialists, right, who, who are trained enough to understand the kind of process through which that photograph was taken. So the audience is prepped effectively. Exactly. And knows how to see and what to read in the photograph. Mm -hmm. And we have in 1977 a very, very important photo book, which is called Evidence, by Mandel and Sultan, so two, 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 two photographers themselves, that create this book Evidence, which is the outcome of viewing thousands of photographs across many different national archives, most of them here in California, and they collect out of these thousands of photographs a few, a dozens, I don't know, 60, 50, I don't remember how many photographs are in the book, taking out of the context and putting them in the context of a photo book. So by taking the photograph out of the context, we lose meaning. They, they are, some of them are very funny, some of them are very serious, some of them are very disturbing, and all of them make sense in a new context, which is the context of an art photo book, eventually also some art exhibition here in this or that museum. So by yes. taking the context, decontextualizing and recontextualizing, we become aware of how the context constructs the photograph. And this is, this, this book is really important in the history of photography, but um, there are many, um, perhaps even more fascinating photographers or artists, conceptual artists who did the same, Baldessari or Ed Rousset and many others, which thought of this idea of what does it mean to take objects, photograph out of context, replacing, changing this, so this is a, fair, a first very powerful way to understand what constructivism in photography yeah, means. Yeah, that's fascinating. A sort of a radical recontextualization or purposeful recontextualization. Yeah. yeah. Are there ways in which um, students can think about how they might participate in that kind of work? Um, I'm thinking that one of the tools for recontextualization is to think very deliberately about the captioning of a photograph that's sort of submitted for a photo photography competition but would sort of to to recontextualize for the audience uh, maybe the caption can be used in a way that that challenges the audience to think about their sort of more aesthetic uh, exhibitionary experience of the photograph versus the context in which it was originally taken i don't know does the caption offer opportunities for doing this recontextualizing work and making surfacing the politics i i think captions are uh, is, is definitely a way to do it yeah um of course it always depends if you want to add text to a photograph mm. so because th this thing I mean, you, you create something here if you add text next to a photograph. And there are well-known um, photo books that do that, where we have the, we can have a single, simple caption describing, mm -hmm. for example, the place where it was taken, the, the time, and so on. We can have a few sentences, we can have a longer text, an iterative text, or a descriptive text. Yeah. or a creative text on the photograph. There are many ways yeah. and how far I interviewed, you go. Um, Ricardo Gomez and uh, he spoke about using the quotations from people as the text. Yeah. Uh, so the subjects are no longer muted. They become uh, sort of revocalized through the, these quota quotations. Yeah. But I think the most powerful way to recontextualize a photograph mm -hmm. or a photographer mm -hmm. Although I'm not sure if this is allowed in the competition, but more generally, is to create a sequence. Ah. So a sequence is a radical, in a certain way, if you want to call it, is a radical constructivism. There is this very well known, probably the most important German photographer, or one of the most important, 
whose name is Michael Smith. So Michael Smith was working a lot with, with sequences, as many contemporary photographers. Um, so sequence is really important in photography. So how do you place the photographs next to each other? And he was saying one and one is three. It's huh. never two. One and one is three. So you create new ways of seeing and thinking a photograph. I see. And if you if you think the video that we will be seeing here yeah. has lots of frames, but you can never ever see in a video clip or in a film a frame as a singularity. It is always always connected to the previous and to the next, to the yeah. previous and to the next. Yeah. And that's what a film is, is this moving image. But photographs retain always a sense of fragment, a fragment, they have a fragmentary character and a sense of singularity. But we, on the other hand, we know from our discussion that we had about the context that we never see them out of context. So we never see an image, a photograph, without thinking of other images. We have other images that we use. But if you do it in a, in a let's say, intended or, or deliberate way, where you put images next to each other by sequencing them, then you create new meanings, new forms of constructivism. And in a certain way, you would think that in film, you cannot really do that. There are a few, if you, if you see Louis Bonuel's uh, Ancien Andalou from 1929, uh, uh, I think. Okay. It's, it's a series, of, it is as close as you get to something that would look, a film that would look as a series of images. Yeah. But in photography, you don't want to have that. You want to bring photographs to speak to each other. And this is the, the radical constructivism of sequencing. You put different photographs together and you create meanings. And that's the photo book. The art of photo book is the art of sequencing that in some is... way or another. When you put them together in a photo book, is the sequence that matters. And that's that's a very, very and powerful way. you can tell a way. story of, uh, in that way. Narrative becomes possible. A yeah, kind exactly. of narrative art. Or I think to break narratives and to create others. To yeah. Decon to decontextualize and recontextualize. Oh, uh, yeah. Is, yeah. is that thing that you do? Because one photograph, well, yeah, is, is not enough to, to create this. Oh, well, I, I think we definitely are going to accommodate series like students want to submit a series of photographs that, that will be a welcome submission to the competition yeah. can we talk a little bit about your own photographs and how you've experimented with this um constructivist approach i know you've taken photographs uh, on and they're available online uh, of the british landscape landscape i'm very familiar with having grown up there uh, and you're interested in these rural landscapes that and that have sometimes been ruined in a sense by industrialized farming and um, other uh, m modern technological interventions. Uh, but you're also interested in the sort of traditional beauty of the English countryside and the relationship between those two sorts of vistas. And and do you see s series as a way of capturing landscape transitions uh, and changes like that? Uh, what, how have you sought to um, put photographs next to each other to address forms of environmental harm or, or change? Yeah, I think is is. Um... Okay, C creating a series or a sequence is something that is very difficult to... Y you do it with photographs. Y the, uh, of course, the, there are some guidelines um, how you can create a sequence. For example, it could be the forms um, in the photograph. So the abstract forms, what brings them together. Um, 
uh, I I would say it's less the content. For example, if they have mm -hmm. the the same subject matter, it doesn't mean that they create a sequence, which we naturally would think. But when you work with photographs, I think there are other ways to to create sequencing. But I think there is something um, very powerful and in a certain way um, very very magical in the sequencing that. You, you put photographs together that that bring they work on different levels they they work on the affective level they work on the aesthetic level they work on the on the temporal level so there are the the creation of a series is not just about how we interpret how we understand the photograph is how we per perceive a photograph experience it. yeah is mm -hmm. And that's the difference between a, fo um, a photograph and words. And that's why it matters if we want, sometimes we want to I put see. words, sometimes not, because the power of the image is that you see it and you have immediately an experience of it. You see a photograph and you experience the whole photograph in itself. While I would need 300 words or 3000 words 30,000 words to, to describe perhaps an image, depending on how what I want to do with it. But I would need to read in a linear way in order to describe an image with words. Yeah. While the image creates an immediate effect okay. or experiential perception. So let me let me um, take a risk here <laughs> and tell you a little bit about how I experience some of your photographs and see if this is part of what you were trying to convey because um you know i came from a relatively poor background in the uk uh and i um nevertheless or you know still enjoy you know what's seen as the idyllic english countryside you know and people ask me oh what do you miss about england and i say oh well country lanes and sheep in fields and old stone walls and things like that and I do miss them, right? Those are, um, but I felt that you were trying to do something really interesting in, in some of your rural landscape photography that was, in a sense, problematizing that kind of easy nostalgia that someone like I, like me, has, um, where you, you kind of uncover the fabricated nature of the, of the beautiful landscape. And you, they, you leave enough clues in um, to, to sort of discomfort someone who says, oh, well, you know, they're, they're looking for the, the winding lane and the cute sheep or whatever. And, and instead, there's something in the picture, like there's some of the fens that you took, that, that makes the viewer feel like, ah, well, it's kind of beautiful, but it's kind of got like, there's that ruined tree over there that's kind of like something horrible happened to it <laughs> or whatever. Or there's like, it looks like a kind of big agricultural dump in the distance. And, um, and you discomfort the viewer in a, for at least for me, a kind of visceral way. Is that what you were going for? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah. I, I wanted to, to move, um, beyond but i have to say uh, i'm you know there are many other people who do it because uh, and many photographers that do it in a fabulous and magnificent way um, but me together with them or following them in a certain way i wanted to break this double that we have and this is ba it is because of the representation of phallus that i we talked earlier th this double um, opposite this these two opposites this binarism that we have in landscape photography on the one hand the beautiful and the sublime mm -hmm. so so this the 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 the, the, the natural beauty um, um that has a long history we can talk about this in a moment well it's class laden that's what one of the reasons i brought up that issue of class positionality because it's associated generally in Britain at least with the landscapes of the wealthy like the of aristocratic course. yeah and those house. who can experience them not only who own them but who can experience them by walking through them how mm. many people can walk uh, through them there is 
um, this fabulous um, British photographer Ingrid Pollard, uh, who was one of the first black photographers photographing the British landscape and um, showing the uneasiness of um, a, a, a black person walking in, in uh, the, the British landscape, something that I felt many times through my accent, for example, if if you walk in these landscapes, you talk to people, there is some uneasiness because it's, um, it, there are questions about belonging and about ownership of the landscape. And th these are represented uh, in the way landscape has been constructed as the beauty, but they are there to this, the, the polar opposite is landscapes of destruction landscapes of endless quarries, environmental dams, yeah. destroyed, um, uh, sang uh, uh, destroyed bird or, or yeah, and you have these um, uh, big um, what look like slurry uh, containers yeah. that you know from some I don't know, giant manure heap that's been industrialized yeah. or something. Yeah, and pollutes all the, yeah. the, 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 the waters near them and, yeah. and, and, and the, the rivers. And so, and usually landscape photography, you know, not usually, often, is positioned in the, in the one or the other opposite. Uh -huh. And uh, I and many other people, of course, uh, are going to think, well, there are all these minor ways of experience beauty and being unsettled in, in our experience of the ecological world. And we are unsettled because so many different parts of these ecological spaces are currently and probably for, have been for a long time in imbalance. Yeah. So how do we capture the sense of being in an imbalance that might not be devastating in the very moment we take the photograph in this very specific landscape, but nevertheless it, it, it is there, and yet we experience or, or some sense of, of um, I don't know, positive affect of yeah, being yeah. in the landscape. I think that's going to be very... Um, meaningful to lots of our students because um, we see all around us in Santa Cruz particularly as you go down to Watsonville and Salinas and into the farming areas these very heavily controlled landscapes for agriculture with tons of plastic everywhere um, big um, silos for pesticides um, that are about to be distributed and so forth um, and um, so there's, there's, there's those kinds of landscapes, and yet um, I think we're all familiar with how we nevertheless live in a, a place that has a lot of beauty to it as well. And that beauty um, has a sort of a utopian promise. Um, and it's a promise that I think that many people at UCSC have sought to, to make embodied in the landscape of the campus um, and um, Jim's photographs of the campus as an ecotone I think speak to this but some of the landscapes like um, the Chadwick Garden which I love to go to or the farm I see those as efforts to build utopias in a dystopian world um, and they're not, not, not complete successes you know there's a lot of controversies and challenges that both those places have gone through over the years but they Nevertheless, hold that utopian promise. And I'd like to think our students, you know, maybe entering a photo photography competition on health could sort of capture that either mm. on campus or in the landscapes that surround it. Mm. I think that sounds a magnificent project, actually, to try to capture this, this ambivalence of the landscape, this inherent ambivalence, which is there. And probably the constructivist moment comes when you try to to think that you 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 make photographs that bring these ambivalences. They don't just show them. So that's why 
we we capture something um but we capture something that is more to what we capture than what the photograph can be and i think that's a good photograph a photograph is the one that doesn't illustrate something that is already present in our optical consciousness but it brings with it some kind some something that is virtual in a place mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't necessarily is visible through the actual things that we photograph but our photograph brings this virtuality uh, and makes it apparent i think the strong photographs and most of the good photographers do do actually this they 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 through the photographs you see virtual possibilities of a space is 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 this constructive moment that brings out the virtual and i think in many landscapes the virtual is this deep ambivalence of a, a landscape that we experience always in a broken way our experience of the landscape is broken because you know we, we experience a beautiful tree and at the same time we know about the decline of trees here or somewhere else yeah we experience about the importance of soil and at the same time we know that most of the soils are depleted or uh, and in rates that are far beyond the rates of regeneration we we experience um, a, a sea but we know that there is a lot of debris, plastic, microplastic, yeah. uh, uh, pollutants in, in the sea. So it is, it is about bringing this ambivalence. And yeah, I mean, we see suffering in the landscape too, I think, right? The, the, around, I mean, just around Santa Cruz, I mean, you can see unhoused folk living in a very, in a way, a very beautiful landscape around the San Lorenzo River. And yet they're living in really horribly rough conditions um, and trying to just eke out survival in this landscape. And I mean, some people's objection to homelessness is simply that they're ruining the landscape, right? Yeah, Not yeah. that their whole lives have been ruined by the way our society is set up. Okay. Um, but um, there's also, you know, as you, if you take that wider view of, of how the landscape is embodying what is wrong with our society, um, you can yeah you, you you see ambivalence there that's that's full of of suffering and damage on the one side, but also promise and human endurance and resilience on the other side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's um, it's this virtual virtual potentials of the landscape that make a landscape I think uh, capturing a landscape image capturing and is a, a lot of this has to to do with time and power so a co constructivism is already is also about revealing power and how this influences uh -huh. the way we take a photograph and there is by definition the moment you 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 have a camera uh, there is a question of power there because who has the camera who owns the camera who holds the camera who operates the camera so there is a question there is a question for landscape photographers of history of images of landscapes and the history of landscape photography is not a, a history that docks onto the onto the landscape painting of the 1800 or even before Poussin or Constable or Turner trying to capture some of his beauty and in the moment of the birth of photography perhaps even through some kind of romantic approach to, 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 to the ecological world but it talks to something very different it talks, it talks to um, uh, uh, the governance of space in documenting space in um, documenting um, military operations in classifications of natural um, 
uh, the natural world of other species, classifications of people. It docks directly on colonial expansion, on extractivism. It docks on the settler um, self-representation, or actually on settler colonial understanding of another landscape that is not so familiar, and the, the appropriation through the photographic image. And then if you think later, it becomes around the 1900s, it comes closer to this artistic understanding of, or aesthetic understanding of landscape. It moves, I mean, both coexist in parallel, the, the more, uh, uh, the, 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 let's say, the, the practical, the, the interventionist, and the uh, uh, photographic landscapes taken through army classification, mm. science, um, comes after, later, after 50 or 60 years closer to the artistic landscapes. But even there, they are always mixed with a sense of, of documenting and doing something with them. They, 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 they left a bit behind the, the purely aesthetic understanding of, of the landscape. And I think revealing this relation of power in how you, for whom you make landscapes, how you make them, how are they used, wh where they are coming from, is, is, um, is quite important in, in, in landscape photography. And in every place that you are, there are these relations of power that mediate what we said before that, you know, yes, you, you are actually photographing a certain landscape, but it's mediated by all these different contexts, technology, uh, sequencing, and so on, and power too. Mm -hmm. And how do you make this visible? How do you visualize um, uh, um, on the landscape traces of, of the colonial past? or new forms of colonization. Or of any other kind of power relations, yeah. yeah or exploitation of uh, <clears throat> migrant labor. Right, uh, which in, is in very the... real here, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I think those questions are, are really great questions to, to end the interview on. I mean, the, the, you've given us so many powerful points about power relations in photography, and I think students are gonna find it really uh, provocative and and useful as they think through how they can use photographs to document health challenges and and opportunities for for building a healthier world. So huge thanks. This is Thank really so really much. inspiring. I look I look for the uh, forward to seeing the photographs. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And good luck with with the competition and good luck with photographing. <laughs>